I want to introduce Kim Zetter, who's going to do the Mr. Robot panel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's good that we're at the end of the session or at the end of the day here, in case we run off a little longer. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any clips for you. Uh, we wanted to put some of those together and maybe show you some of the hacks in progress as they were developed. But this kind of came together uh, in short notice last minute, so we don't have that. But we do have a great panel of experts here who are going to answer all of your technical questions, except anything that involves a spoiler. Um, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, I'll go through some questions, but we definitely want this to be interactive. We want all of you guys to feel free. Um, I, I can give you sort of a signal um, when we're going to be getting ready to take audience questions, and we definitely want your questions. So, um, I'm, you all know that we're in here for the Mr. Robot panel, right? Okay. Just want to make sure you're in the right place. Um, okay, so I was talking with Core. I don't know if I needed to give you like a summary of the show, right? You all know the show, right? Okay, great. All right, so I'm just going to introduce the panelists then. And you guys aren't in the order that I thought you were going to be in. So, um, well, Core is in the center. So why don't we start with Core? So we've got Cora Donna in the blue checked shirt there. Cora is a writer and tech producer of Mr. Robot, um, but he actually comes from our community. He worked as a network security analyst and forensic manager for Toyota Motor, Motor Sales, where he did pen testing, designed security policies, did forensics for the legal and HR departments. That is until he got his big break in Hollywood in 2013 um, uh, as a production intern initially, and then two years later, he, got his, he scored his job with the Mr. Robot team. And I'm going to ask him a little bit about how he got there. Um, in addition to writing scripts, he oversees all technical aspects of the show. So that's not just about putting the hacks together, but he makes sure that the, uh, the hardware that's being used is correct, that the set direction um, is accurate and all of that as well. Uh, Tor, uh, sorry, Core put together a core team of uh, consultants, uh, security experts to assist him with that. And that's who we've got here. Um, so let, I guess I'll start on the far right there and come forward to me. Uh, now I've got to switch gears here. So we've got at the far right there is Andre McGregor. Uh, he's director of security for Tanium, uh, managing their internal security, but he's a former FBI agent. And so he assists in uh, all of the FBI forensic stuff uh, on the show. Um, and unlike many feds, he actually has a computer engineering background and knows some of this stuff. <laughs> so prior to joining, prior to joining the bureau, he worked as an engineer at Goldman Sachs and was IT director uh, for Cardinal Health Advocate. Uh, in his work with the Bureau, he helped establish the first cyber national security squad for FBI's New York field office and led numerous large-scale cyber investigations involving everything from financial crime to critical infrastructure intrusions. Uh, next, do I need to intro uh, Jeff? <laughs> Jeff Moss, everyone. Everyone knows him. Um, Dark Tangent, of course, founder and director of Black Cat, more importantly of DEF CON, uh, which began in 1993. Uh, former Freaker, uh, is now a widely recognized computer security expert, who in 2009 was appointed to the Homeland Security Advisory Council to provide advice and recommendations to the Secretary on matters related to Homeland Security. And from 2011 to 2013, he served as ICANN's Chief Security Officer. You all know Jeff. Uh, next to CORE is uh, Ryan, uh, am I just Kazansian? Did I get it right? Okay. Uh, Chief Security Architect for Tanium and has 13 years of experience in incident response and forensics, pen testing, and security architecture. Prior to joining uh, Tanium, is that Tanium or Tanium? Tanium, sorry. Uh, he was a technical director and lead investigator for uh, Mandiant, where he worked with dozens of Fortune 500 organizations, organizations involved in targeted attacks, although I assume that E Corp wasn't one of them. Um, he also helped train FBI agents. And finally, you guys all know CJ. This is Mark Rogers, uh, who all you know is CJ C. Junkie, uh, is an old school hacker who heads information security at Cloudflare and is a longtime goon here at DEF CON. Uh, Mark's uh, obviously well known for pioneering some, hack, pioneering some hacks in the 90s. And last year, he gave that fantastic presentation on hacking a Tesla. So um, I'm going to start with some overview questions, uh, primarily initially directed at CORE. I want everyone to jump in uh, with any questions that you feel are relevant to you. But just to get us started on sort of the overview, I want to, uh, CORE, uh, just give us an idea of how exactly the show came together with him. Um, really quickly before I get into that, 
Yeah. I want to say to the two members. Can you guys hear me now? All right. Really quickly, before yeah. I get into that, I just want to say that there are two members of the consulting team who couldn't be with us here today, uh, Michael Bazell and James Clough. And Michael, if you're here, put your hand up, because I think he's supposed to be here. If not. All right. Um, inspiration for the show, our creator and showrunner, Sam Esmail, uh, he is Egyptian, and he has relatives who are living in Egypt who had to who experienced the Arab Spring. And just dealing with that and knowing how a younger generation was able to use technology in a way to thwart internet censorship and get the access that they needed using technology or social media was a huge inspiration for Mr. Robot. That coupled with the fact that uh, Sam and I believe many people in this room share uh, this disdain for how Hollywood has portrayed technology and hacking in film and television up to this point. And upon my first meeting with him, that's like the first thing that we bonded over was how much we hated that and how we would cringe every time we'd see a show about hacking or a movie about hacking. So we wanted to do it right and we thought that doing it in a realistic way would be dramatic and would be enticing and compelling. And that really empowered me to just, uh, and I got into a lot of fights and altercations since that moment, and I still continue to do so, um, even with these guys. Uh, but it's all in the name of making it authentic and making it realistic, and hopefully we're doing a good job of that, and hopefully we continue to do a good job of that. Um, so those are the two main inspirations for the show. So how did Sam get the characterization of Elliot Alderson so spot on? Because that's, it's not just the hacks that Hollywood gets wrong, it gets wrong the hackers and the, and the culture in the community. So Sam, Sam dabbled a bit in hacking as a teenager, but by no means does he refer to himself as a, as a hacker these days. But it's interesting, having been exposed to both worlds, um, writing and just the tech community and the hacking community, I see that just the isolation the stress, the anxiety, the social awkwardness, uh, the amount of time spent alone in front of a computer problem solving, how frustrated I used to get when I tried to code and I tried to solve problems and I couldn't figure it out is very similar to the stresses that I experienced breaking story or, or trying to nail a scene or, or writing one of these scripts. So I think just the comparison between a hacker and a writer from a anxiety perspective is very, very similar. Um, and the, the drug usage, the, the social awkwardness, all, all of this, I, I think Sam just infused his experience as a writer and put it into this hacker character. And it works because of those worlds are very similar. And I've been able to make those connections of how similar those two worlds are. And of course, you're using different parts of your brain. Um, but still, I think a lot of that isolation and loneliness is, uh, is rampant in both worlds. So I think that's why it works. And I think that's why so many people in this community can relate to Elliot, because mm -hmm. it's, it's hard dealing with people. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about DEF CON is you, can all, you guys all get together and, and actually you know, connect with each other in real life. So mm -hmm. But he also gets, I mean, the other hackers that we see in shows are sort of, let's, let's say black hat, let's just call it out, um, where they're all powerful and they're, um, they're not human, essentially. Um, and Elliot is very human and vulnerable and uh, basically psychologically messed up and a lot of things, uh, mentally unstable. Um, and those elements all exist in this community. We have, you know, suicides in the community and a lot of stuff like that. And he gets that. And that was unusual, I felt like, so. And again, I think that's, that's prevalent even in the writing community as well. It's, an, it's another similarity that just, it, it's, it's the engine that makes the show work. Mm -hmm. And I think the character vulnerability and him dealing with his demons in that way is what draws you to him and makes him relatable. He's not a superhero. He's, mm -hmm. uh, he's terribly flawed, but he has good intentions mm -hmm. and he wants to change the world for the better, even if by doing so, he ends up destroying the world. Um, it's just, it's compelling that way. Yeah, you can face them, and, and I think that's the problem is when you turn to me, and they can't hear you. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, sort of uh, forming this group of consultants, because the first season, um, the first show, the pilot, Sam had done uh, without you. Without me, yep. Um, and then after the first, the pilot, after it got picked up, uh, you, you came on board. 
Um, but you only had one consultant at that time for the first year, correct? Yeah, Second. it was me and Michael Bazell working on the, that first season. Uh, and uh, it, the, the role didn't really exist. I kind of just fell into it. I was working for Sam. I was in the room. I was pitching ideas. And he knew that I had a cybersecurity background, so he knew that I could help in that way. So I remember looking at the original Bible for season one, and the Evil Corp hack that he had planned out was very fantastical and kind of crazy. And I, I said, well, if we want to ground this in reality, this is how I would do it. And this is where you know your data, your data targets would be, and these would be the different methods of taking them down. And from that, we kind of explored the, you know, attacking the offsite tape backups and uh, a, a redundant data center in China for you know disaster recovery or redundancy. Um, so just we kind of formed the network infrastructure for Evil Corp early on, and that kind of dictated our trajectory for the season one, the big hack of season one. And it was me and Michael Bazell coming up with a lot of those ideas and incorporating them into the show. And uh, I was lucky enough to form an even bigger team um, for, for season two, which was, which was awesome. So uh, why don't you walk us through, uh, I just want to get to the hacking, um, obviously. Um, so a lot of the hacking appears to be grabbed straight from the headlines. Uh, this is, um, you know, Straight from the headlines and also from Black Cat and DEF CON. Let's, let's just admit you're cribbing from us, right? I totally am. So <laughs> the, the prison hack was uh, DEF CON 2011 DEF CON 19, I believe. Uh, Teague Tiffany Newman, Rad. Tiffany Rad. Yeah. Yep. There was a white paper and there was a great demo I found on YouTube that I studied. And that was the inspiration for that last hack in that show. Um, so definitely ripping you guys off 100%. <laughs> Um, so now I got one of you guys on my team, which is great. <laughs> uh, so you've had the ransom, no car hacking yet though. Ransomware, um, the IoT hacking obviously, uh, latest episode we've got the hacking Android phones with a rogue femme to sell. Um, and also the affiliate link hack that Darlene does to get free food. Um, so explain to us what is the process for coming up with the hacks. Uh, do you have a hack idea first and then it gets written into the plot? Is the plot written first and then you come up with a hack that suits the plot? And then how do you guys work together? Um, so, the story ideas come first, and story will always come first. Uh, we will always act in the best interest of the story. So I'm in the room every day with a group of other very talented writers pitching story ideas, trying to nail down the structure and the arcs for the season. And in those, there are breaks in those discussions where Sam will say, all right, here we need to have a hack. We don't know what it's gonna be, but Elliot's gonna hack, and he's gonna be at this point in the story after we're done. Um, so after that, I'll reach out to my team, these guys, and we'll have a brainstorming session. And I'll say, this, we need to work within the confines of this story point. And we need to get Elliot from point A to point B. And what is available to us, and what's realistic, and what makes sense, um, and what's efficient, what's smart, and what would be cool to see visually on screen. So it's weird that we kind of have two different writers' rooms working in tandem. I have, we have the story writers' room, and then we have our technical writers' room, where we throw out ideas, argue with each other, try and find the best option. And then once we finalize an idea together, I bring it back to the room and it gets incorporated into the script. And at that point, it's like really short general description, maybe a couplet in one of the scripts that just describes the hack, big picture. Once we get to production, um, that's where the nitty gritty detail work starts because we actually have to pull off the hack. So I need to work with the props department to make sure the hardware looks completely accurate and they've never heard of a Raspberry Pi before, so I have to <laughs> tell them exactly, like, here, we're, here's where you can buy one, here's the, here's the, the model we need. Um, I have to work with set dressing to make sure that, you know, we don't have a ridiculous amount of, you know, Cat5 cable all over the arcade when there are only, like, five workstations there. Um, I have to work really closely with an animator and these guys to nail exactly what the screen content looks like. So, oftentimes, one of these guys will do the hack for real, and will send me screenshots or video of it, and then I have to take it to a flash animator, and we build out an interactive animation based on what these guys did, and it's something that we can put in front of Rami or Christian, and they don't even have to think about it, they can hit the wrong keystrokes, and the right characters will show up on screen, and the screen will behave the right way we need it to, and we shoot all of these sequences practically. Um, Sam hates using green screen, I hate using green screen, so we don't burn it in after, f after the fact, 
And uh, even that process, like these guys will tell you how many times I've called them up at four in the morning saying we need to fix this and it needs to be ready by 9 a.m. And then I have to work with an animator and go through like 15, 20 revisions to make sure that there are no typos and make sure that everything's working properly for him to rebuild this terminal sequence or, or, or whatever screens we're seeing. And then I have to work with the actors to try and get it right. And then I work with a, a completely separate uh, insert unit, a small splinter crew to shoot all the close-ups and the inserts that we cut to in building out these sequences. So we're filming raked shots of hands on a keyboard and I have to make sure that you know, they're hitting alt tab when they need to toggle windows at the right time. Like little, little things that you don't think about and that no one in production and no one in Hollywood really cares about, but on this show is a big deal to us and we want to nail those details. And luckily, you guys are picking up on those details, which I'm really happy about. I, uh, I will have to say that uh, I've worked some of the, the largest breaches in the, in the US history and working for CORE is worse than all of those. <laughs> <laughs> Because at least when I would go home from the FBI, I was at home. Core would still call me at three o'clock in the morning yeah. and say, "I need an output. I need I need you to take a video of uh, of exactly what the output would, you know Elliot would be doing, and then send it to me in the next hour because we're we're doing the animation." And, but what was cool is if you've noticed that there's some Easter eggs that are are there, so you get to add that. Um, when it doesn't work, we have to work through it, you know, for several hours to, or, or change the hack. I mean, there's multiple times which we unfortunately will not go through uh, all of them, but we had a hack in place and it was in the script and everyone, everything was ready to go and then all of a sudden it was, uh, I, that's not gonna work. You know, actually when we tried to do the hack, it did not work. Can, so you, had to can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us what the hack was and what didn't work? Uh, no, because we may actually use it again, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but I'll allude to the fact that the first episode was not the hack that you saw was not the original hack. Yeah, he's referring to the ransomware attack on Bank of E in the first episode of season two. Can you guys hear everyone? But but even then you have to think. C louder. Pick up the mics and hold them in your hand. Yeah. No, no, uh, no, but even then it, it it goes beyond just the hack. It, specifically with that particular episode, it was the set design and what we would need to be able to you know have a bank and and the systems that we would need and the type of personnel that would have access to the systems that we would want and how we would portray that on the show to make it realistic for people to say yes, someone with that skill set or someone with that job role would have access to that system and if I plugged in a device or if I you know, accessed uh, you know, a specific system, it could pivot to the next system and then have a cascading effect. Um, that's the level of detail that we're going in because I know that you guys are looking at the same thing and we don't want it to make CSI cyber where it's green code is good and red code is malware. You, saw, you guys all saw that? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's also really surprising how disproportionate the amount of work that goes into some of these things. If you look at some of the, if you the even look at some of the really smallest things, like the affiliate links hack is what, only a couple of seconds of screen time. Yeah, and that, it's just dialogue. Yeah, that was days of discussion because the original script, the, the hack that was laid out there, we hated it. We wanted to shape it into something that would really work. And so it went round and round and we reshaped it into something which ultimately people are dissecting it and writing entire articles on those few seconds. That's when we know we got it right. What was it originally that you rejected? We, you can go into it. Are you guys familiar with what he's talking about, the affiliate hack? Why don't you describe it? So the, the affiliate link hack was basically Mike. Mike. Dar Darlene's getting free food by using affiliate links that belong to her boyfriend so that she gets credited for whatever clicks that he should have been credited for. And the original hack involved DNS cache poisoning and this massively elaborate system. And I, I looked at it and went, that's not realistic, right? There's no way you would expend that level of effort for something as simple as that, when there are so many other elegant, simple ways in which you can do it. And we bounced around the team and came up with multiple different options. And the one we went with in the end was, actually we would target a specific piece of infrastructure in the telco, the proxy APN, and by compromising that, anything that goes through that APN gets rewritten into whatever we want. And the net result is, a realistic hack that could be pulled off in the real world and could have real world implications. And 
That's the kind of st hack that I want to put myself behind. So this was a, this was a hack involving the Postmates website, this is the Postmates dot com. Yeah. When anytime anyone would order food, um, Darlene would get a free ten dollar coupon for food. Anyone time anyone would order a food delivery, she would suddenly get a, a ten dollar coupon for fr free food. And something else that I should just note: the script. If if we have an issue with the hack, the script changes. I come up, I, I go to Sam or I go to the other writers and I say, we need to find another w way around this. And it's, it, it's interesting because I always, I think the most common argument that I had in the room, especially in season two, was uh, Sam would want, you know, a big hack that's, that's intricate and complicated and it'll fill this page for, you know, to, to turn the scene to get Elliot to this next point in the story. And then when we talked about it, we'd be like, all right, it's pretty simple and it's actually smarter and more efficient if we have him do this, but it's not as sexy on screen. So if I throw that idea out, Sam's like, well, that sucks. I don't want to do that. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's boring. So we have to strike that balance of what is visually compelling, what will move the story forward, and still meet the expectations of the tech crowd that's analyzing you know, the technology being used and the motivations for the hack and, and the tactics that are being used. Yeah, and for me, it's, it's almost like being in a virtual penetration test where, you know, if you've ever done pen testing or red teaming work, you always end up in this situation where you're a couple of days in and nothing you've tried has worked and you're kind of stuck and you have, you know, a set of things you do have access to and a set of goals and you've got to figure out how to cross that chasm and get from point A to B. And a lot of times the story is exactly that, you know, Core will come to us and say, so here's the context, here's what needs to come out of it, and um, it's awesome that if that requires adjustment in dialogue or tweaks to the scene to make it real, they're totally willing to do that. The second part of it that's fun is, you know, my initial reaction to a lot of these that I worked uh, with Core on was, wow, how are we gonna make this technically accurate? And it's that same sort of conundrum, and so you, you sit and brainstorm the way you do when you're actually in a, a real world pen test and think, well, if I did this and then this and then this, that actually could kind of get the characters there. And then it's all about, let's do it on screen, let's try to use some re real tools, let's use Kali Linux, let's simulate as much of it as possible, and then streamline it down to what can maybe fit in a couple seconds of screen time here or there. I want to come back to the, oh, do you want to? Uh, I was just going to say, what, what is, uh, on the other side of that, what's very hard is, if, and if you haven't caught up, you're going to, you know that the FBI is about to be hacked, having to walk through the technical accuracy of hacking the FBI without disclosing state secrets and national and, and having national security get to impl yes. implications. <laughs> and being able to do it in such a way where you're able to gain access to the information that will obviously advance uh, F society, but not reveal anything that I don't want anyone in this room to be able to also uh, leverage. <laughs> so. The recipe to hack yeah, the FBI. Yeah, we must have had, I don't know how many hours we've discussed FBI infrastructure and how to <laughs> hack yes. the FBI, but yes. it, a, lot of, a lot of work went into it. I know so much about hacking the FBI now. <laughs> <laughs> and the Next FBI knows that you know that. <laughs> hey, I, I, um, wanted to, I, I want to come back to the hacking, but I wanted to jump to OPSEC for a second here. Uh, Jeff uh, wrote a great article for Playboy in which he uh, uh, pointed out some of the, the OPSEC issues with the hacking group. Um, right. The mobile well, phones so and all that. It's yeah. tough because I love the show. And so I don't want to be that guy on the side of the road, pick, you know, I'm picking off, a, oh, well, they forgot a comma. No, they didn't. Yeah. Well, but you tell a story about how Sam sits there and like at the moment something, somebody online says something negative about the show, it's like Sam calls you. It's like, did we get that right? Because yep. um, he's so obsessed. And so it's tough because I want to provide criticism but I, or an, an insight, but I don't obviously want to tell you your job. And so that's why in my last article I was talking about <coughs> surveillance um, operations and I, I was trying to guess like, well, is she being followed? Are you trying to show that Darlene is um, freaking out as she's seen ghosts, you know, where there aren't any. So I just had to assume, no, she's really probably being followed because there's some dark army action going on, there's some FBI action. So let's just pretend she's being followed. What did she just do wrong and what did the followers do wrong? Like you would never reveal yourself as a follower unless you were trying to send a message to the person you were following. And you'd only do that if you want them to change their behavior or spook them and then see what their reaction is, see how they behave. Like you reveal that they're being, that you're following them and you see, can you force an error? and what does that error reveal, right? You see this in TV all the time. Um, and so I've been having a lot of fun with it because I'm tying it back to other books and I'm trying to think of other movies, so I'm trying to you know, draw a broader picture. But so far, you've been getting almost everything right, which is pretty cool. Um, surveillance is really, really hard to do. And 
at some point, you know, you're going to have to start criticizing by saying, well, how do these people who have never done this before professionally, mm -hmm. they don't have professional training, you don't learn how to do like tag team surveillance, counter surveillance, unless you actually do it. So at some point, I'm waiting for them to put on VR goggles and say, no, wait, I'm practicing my counter <laughs> surveillance runs. Um, and so we're just assuming that they have all the skill and all this knowledge. Um, and so at some point, I'm waiting for the backstory of like, how do they learn all of this stuff? If we ever do that, or if we ever drop a Cat5 cable out of an airplane into <laughs> a car <laughs> underneath it, I want you to all kill me. <laughs> um, there is something else that I do want to touch on. What, Echoing what Ryan was uh, was saying about using real tools. Yes, Can I, I bring this up. Yes. Can I talk about this? Uh, I, uh, let me just let's just introdu introduce this for a second here because one of the things that uh, we've seen we've all seen in Mr. Robot is that they are actually using the true tools. We've seen uh, Dave Kennedy's set tool um, and everything else. And Core is very adamant about making sure not just that the hacks are correct, but that the tools are correct. But he gets a lot of grief for it. So why don't you talk about it? So it is a ongoing struggle between me and uh, the legal department at NBC Universal um, in an effort to clear real tools on a hacking show and especially using the tools in a way where maybe they're they're helping a hack or they're associated with a hack connected to a hack in some way or something there's some negative connection and unfortunately uh, our roles are just that's the nature of the beast. We're pitted against each other because they want to minimize legal risk and I want to make the most authentic show that I can. So it is very difficult for me to convince our clearance department to reach out to companies in, and to ask permission to use the tool. Um, it's very, very hard. I've had so many conversations, very contentious conversations around that very topic. So it is easier, and, and actually, we've taken risks, and I've had Mark reach out to, to members of the community, I've reached out to members of the community, and we got some great feedback, and luckily these people were fans of the show, so we were able to incorporate those, that, you know, that software, that piece of hardware in the show, but it's much easier for me if you guys come, you guys reach out to me directly. If you guys reach out and say, hey, I want to showcase my tool or this piece of software in the show, I want to hear about it. And I know I've read some articles recently about product placement and integration, and, and that's, all, that's all bullshit. Like, this show, uh, a theme of this show is cons consumerism and consumer culture. And from day one, Sam and I have even, we've always talked about wanting to use as many brands as possible, wanting to showcase as many brands as possible and just really explore the world of, of, of Evil Corp and businesses and, and how they operate. So it, it helps us, it, makes, it helps us ground the show in reality if we can use real software. So if you guys want, if you guys want your tool showcasing the show, let me know because it's much easier if you express interest first instead of me having to convince um, a conglomerate to, <laughs> you to, actually, to reach out to you. You actually used a real company uh, with a DDoS. It was Prolexic uh, yeah. in the first season. Yeah, definitely. Um, we used a lot of we used a lot of real companies in in the first season, and it's just there are these there are these instances where we do kind of a knockoff where it looks like a specific tool, but we can't make it look exactly like it. And I just kind of I just want to stay away from that. I would much rather use uh, real tools, real solutions. So, uh, Mark, you had said that uh, you know when you're doing the the real simulations of the hacks um, and you're going through the steps. Um, you talked about actually consulting with outside experts in some cases uh, with different expertise uh, to figure out reactions, kinetic reactions and things like that. You want to talk about that a second? Yeah, and it's not just me. I think everyone in the team has reached out. Um, there are a couple of, uh, can I go into detail on, uh, uh, on the thing at the place? <laughs> can I go into details about the thing at the place at the time? So, <laughs> it, that, so that it, uh, the problem is I, I'd love to talk about all of this stuff, but we can't because we don't want to give away spoilers that will damage the story or spoil any of the illusion that's coming on. But let's just say there are a number of things that happen in different parts of the show, and if we have any doubts about the realism, or if we have any concerns about the physics involved or the science behind it, we will reach out to experts, professors in some cases, and talk to them and say, look, in this hypothetical situation, which I can't tell you about, and I can't tell you why, would this work? Is this realistic? How would you expect this to happen? Is there any advice you can give us about what to expect? And we take that on board and we use that to shape what we do and ultimately 
the, the production team uses that to shape everything that goes on from that point. And, and we do that with everything, by the way. It's not just from an IT perspective or a, a scientific perspective, even from a, an economics perspective or a psychology perspective. We, we seek out um, experts in those fields to make sure that we are nailing the accuracy of what would a post 5.9 world look like? Uh, what would Elliot, how, how would Elliot react to certain situations having, you know, dealing with these delusions and, and these inner demons? So it's, it's something that we, we, we always want to reach out to experts in those fields. So what are your favorite hacks so far in the show, each of you? It doesn't have to be one that you worked on or it could be or, or Jeff, do you have a favorite that you've seen? Well, the one that, that kind of hooked me, finally I was all in on the show, was when I started seeing hacks fail. Because normally the hack always works, and just at the right time. And I think it was toward the end of season one when they were dropping USB keys and the keys didn't work, and then the, fire, uh, I mean the police department antivirus or something caught something. And all of that stuff made me think, okay, great. You know, now are they going to problem solve? How are they going to get around that? And I, the failure of the hack was actually more uh, impressive to me than the success of the hack. Uh, the first thing that hooked me was actually really simple. It was when Elliot in season one guessing people's passwords. Uh, the fact that it wasn't like in you know conventional TV depictions where it's just guessing something super obvious like password one. It was combinations of pattern password patterns that people often use, like uh, last two digits of the year they're born with a really common password phrase and. If you ever done password cracking or looked at the statistical analysis of most common password patterns and dumps, you see exactly that. So his whole mindset about figuring out passwords for his different targets and, and how realistically that was portrayed really made me realize, like, wow, they're actually thinking about this in a realistic manner. Uh, for me, season two, episode one, where you had the booby-trapped computer that lit on, got, that lit on fire. The thermite. Uh, I've, I've been in so many situations where I've, I've watched my peers uh, not, not really do the, 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 the proper chain of custody and evidence collection for an incident response. And, you know, it, it's very accurate when you're, you know, the local state police departments that are, are still trying to figure out how to deal with computers and how to deal with digital evidence. And uh, it, it was just very accurate. And I, I, I think you'll, you'll see that as the season grows that there's more of an FBI presence and, and how the FBI would deal with incident response and, and, and a data breach. But that was uh, a pretty cool hack. This is always a hard question for me because I'm really torn because I, you know, I love a lot of the hacks that we did in season one and that we're doing in season two. Um, but if I had to choose one, it would probably be episode five uh, when Mobley uses set to spoof a, a text message to one of the workers um, to create a diversion. Uh, I just this was in the data center where they had to get, Elliot was trying to deposit the Raspberry Pi. Correct. Needed Correct. to get a worker and he spoofs. Actually, my favorite might be the Raspberry Pi. I take it back. I, I love it. In that same episode when <laughs> they edit the Wikipedia page to uh, give Elliot's cover identity Stand some background. Real. Yeah, the amazing part of that is I'm seeing that scene for the first time. I'm thinking, well, that's not realistic because like, if that's a high profile person, his Wikipedia page isn't going to just be editable by everyone. But no, then the dialogue in the show, like one scene later, sets credibility for him having spent all those years building up reputation so that he could edit those yeah. Wikipedia pages. Yeah, and then I remember watching that scene and I was thinking, uh-oh, Elliot didn't put on any gloves. His fingerprints are all over that Raspberry Pi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, did you have a favorite? I, I, I have to say, I, I loved all of them. Um, for me, the biggest thing was I've watched the whole of season one and I didn't throw anything at the TV. <laughs> You had said, you had said uh, when we had talked that uh, your goal in going into season two was actually to make the hacks more elaborate than season one. Um, and, so, and you were also concerned that hacking can become very repetitive um, because hackers tend to, when they find something successful, they tend to repeat it over and over and over again. So how are you going to, I mean, this show could go on for five years. Like, how are you going to um, get over that issue of re repetition? I think the way they're doing it is by widening the team and bringing on new minds with new ideas. And it, it is tough because like in the real world as a hacker, you'll have certain things that you do really well and you'll keep using them because if they're successful, why change them? Uh, but that doesn't make for great TV because, you know, okay, so he's gonna throw the USB sticks down again, yay. Um, much better if we can come up with some more interesting things. And by bringing in new characters and by bringing in new experts, 
it widens the palette. Yeah, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of people in different disciplines in, in InfoSec, and one of the things that was fun for me was in working in a few of the really elaborate uh, hacks that are to come later this season was trying to draw on a few different disciplines that haven't previously been shown uh, in the preceding hacks. And so, you know, you think about all the different fields, reverse engineering, application layer exploits, and, you know, we're just starting to scratch the surface, I think, of the types of hacks that you can see, the types of devices that are targeted, the techniques that people are using. So, um, yeah, hacking can get repetitive, but I think there's, there's still this just whole world of different interesting things we can show that are both realistic to the situation and also for people who are pausing the screen and uh, tweeting screenshots uh, has some good stuff to dig into. I just want to let you know if you guys have questions, you can start lining up. Feel and just free. so you guys know, that's a pro that's like a primary problem that we discuss internally. Uh, this group up here, um, we're constantly talking about these ideas about how what would be the most efficient hack to use for this situation. And then someone will throw out an idea, and I'll have to say, no, we did that in episode three yeah. of season one, so we can't do that again. We have to. Th we have to think of something else that still makes sense. So we have to justify why we're not doing that again and why we're doing this new tactic and why that makes sense for, for this episode. So what mistakes so have you made? Oh, sorry, go I ahead, Jeff. I was saying, if you do want to line up for questions, the microphone's just right here in the middle. Yeah. What mistakes have you made? Because Cor, you know, Jeff brought up the, the, uh, the fact that you know, Sam is basically, and you are on Reddit and Twitter. You're not watching the shows when they air, but you're actually watching the reactions to the show. And when people do point out mistakes, he makes sure that you know about them. So. Yeah. There were, um, in season one, there were some screens that had typos, and there were things that just slipped through the cracks of just, you know, at some point, if you do a screen capture on one of the PDFs, uh, and, and you see it in episode four, I think, uh, there was a lot of just gibberish, and that was because of the animator who was working on it just, r just ran, didn't fall asleep, but just kind of ran the, the text that I gave him through, like, this randomizer, and just, just put that into it, because... Uh, there was a clearance issue, and I, it just slipped through. So I fixed it for the second time we saw it in episode six or seven, I believe. Um, but then I think on Elliot's drug report in episode three, marijuana is spelled incorrectly. <laughs> like, things like that. I got an email from Sam saying, why did this happen? Why are, we do why are we making stupid mistakes like this? You also had a phone in airplane mode or something. We What's did have a phone in airplane mode. We had Gideon's phone in airplane mode. So it's... it's uh, it's interesting, because now I know who we're dealing with, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, haven't had, we haven't had many instances of that in season two, because I'm kind of a Nazi when it comes to these screens, and if there is a mistake or a typo, uh, I work with post-production to fix it before it airs, so hopefully this kind of thing doesn't happen, but again, it's, I'm sure something is going to slip through the cracks again, because we have people devoted to screenshotting this and then posting it <laughs> on social media um, and then making my job and my life much harder. Thank you. Let's take a question. Go ahead. You. Um, Andre? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering um, if you were involved in season one. Uh, you're you've worked at Goldman Sachs and given like the culture of the show and like the messages behind it, uh, why and when you left Goldman Sachs and uh, if that had any like your bearings on like how realistic it is to have someone on the inside in a bank, a big bank. So, so I, I, didn't, I didn't work uh, season one, but it's an interesting question because uh, Goldman Sachs is, uh, has a very sharp culture, is what I will say, when it comes to technology and when it comes to security. And being an engineer in that space, in, in the financial sector, in New York, and then being an agent investigating intrusions for the financial sector in New York really had a lot of barriers for sort of uh, innovation and imagination that you might get in Silicon Valley, where I am now. And so... I think you, that, that culture that you see in season one is v and uh, at E Corp is almost identical to my experiences when I was at Goldman Sachs when I was just graduated college. And I, I could see that exact world today. And um, you know, I, 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 I've seen it in other, in other situations, but I think you're right, Goldman Sachs, I think is probably the, sh the sharpest of, of the ones that are there. Any other question? Have to? Thank you. 
How did the decision come through in the writing group? To, Can't hear you. Uh, how did the decision in the uh, writing group come to have Elliot uh, break the fourth wall so often and so mm. frequently to turn to face the audience, us, and have that active dialogue? I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Did everyone hear the question? So the question was, how did we come up with the idea to have Elliot break the fourth wall and actually address us as his friend? Um, and I can't, I, I can't, I have to give all the credit to Sam on that because he wrote that into the pilot before we ever formed a writer's room. And if you read even the early drafts of that pilot, when it was a feature, it opened with, hello, friend, and him speaking to us. And it's, it's weird because it, it really draws you in. And when I read it and when I saw the, the pilot, it, it really, I, I bought in to this connection that I had with this character who is addressing me in this way that, I, you know, I've never seen a show do that before in that way. And what he, in the, way, the ways in which he's vulnerable with us, uh, in the ways in which he blames us for certain things, and now he's upset with us, uh, doesn't really trust us, I, it's, it's fascinating, and we talk about that in the room, and it's, it's weird. We treat the viewer, we treat friend as a character in the room when we're breaking the story and when we're talking about it, and it's, uh, it's something we really take, it, take into account with everything. So um, I have to, that's all Sam. No, it's true. I, I haven't seen many movies or shows that do that in that way. Um, hi, I think this is an incredibly groundbreaking show. It's amazing. I, and I work in consumer education. Come a little closer to the mic. Sorry, I work in consumer education, so, and I understand the importance of how it is for us to see that this hacking is right, but what is your team hoping for the normal person to get out of the show? Are you trying to educate people more on the threats that are out there, or is it just edutainment? Well, Anyone feel free to jump in when I go through this, but uh, <laughs> uh, we live in an, uh, an age where we are more and more dependent on our devices and our technology. And there are a lot of people, even in, in the younger generation, who know how to use these apps, know how to use their smartphones, but they don't know the ways in which they're vulnerable. And if the show can shine a light on that and make them think about like, oh shit, if I leave my phone you know, unlocked, uh, this is how long it takes for someone to root it and install uh, a piece of malware. I think that that's great. If it, if it increases that level of paranoia and awareness, I think that's a very good thing. Yeah, I think for me, it's unavoidable now to, no matter what, you know, what walk of life you're from, to just stay isolated from the hacks that make the news every week. Um, that's great from an awareness perspective, but it also has a numbing effect. And what I love is for that and for the show, to really have consumers expect more of the companies that are building the software they use and depend upon that they trust to keep their data private. Because the reality is, if they're not putting that pressure, then organizations are always going to take shortcuts and we're going to keep dealing with poorly developed services, poorly designed software, corners cut, and uh, we all have seen the effects of that. So I love getting that awareness up. I love getting people thinking and caring and changing their behaviors based on that. You know what, it, it's, it's, it's just refreshing for my mother to know what I've been working on for so many years in life. <laughs> and and I, say it, I, I say it honestly because, you know, <laughs> we, we spend so many years trying to educate the public uh, and it's not working, right? I mean, finally, I, I opened up CNN this morning and I noticed that seven of the various com um, uh, conversations and uh, presentations at Black Hat were on the cover of CNN. I mean, two, three years ago, that was not the case. I mean, we're getting to a point where people are starting to understand technology, and we're getting to the point now where, you know, hopefully we get the education in before people have the personal pain that I think we experience with hacks like Sony and hacks like uh, what we're seeing with the campaigns and the iCloud pho photo hacks. We, we're, we're waiting for that, that big cyber 9-11 moment, which hopefully never happens, but I think we're all expecting it to happen. And if we can get to a point where the public understands that password one, two, three is not good, and uh, <laughs> the point where we, we should you know, have a little bit more understanding of our security, and we do it through a show that's, that's fun, um, you know, that's a win on my, my part. For me, I've been doing DEF CON for 18 years. And for 18 years, I've watched TV shows portray my community like a bunch of weirdos, like a bunch of idiots who don't know anything about computers, who have portrayed hacks as these mystical things that happen when you 
connect magical devices to, to cars and suddenly remote control them. And I'm sick of it. I want to see real stuff on TV that doesn't make me rage. And I want to see accurate portrayals of people in my community, people I can relate to. And so being able to do this and be part of this, for me, was a gift. Well, it's well, funny you mentioned that, Mark, because uh, I always remember this story. Uh, have you ever seen Die Hard 4, Live Free or Die Hard, where the FBI cyber divisions kind of focus? Well, I always remember the, the producer, the director came to the FBI headquarters and wanted to see what cyber division was like. And then as they got a tour, they were very d disappointed because it looked like a 1960s middle school. And, you know, as agents, we would watch the movie and we're like, man, I wish we had all this technology. <laughs> <laughs> like, like so. It's like enemy of the state. Right. Yeah. I, 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 you wish you had that. And so, you know, we show something that's, that's, you know, fabulous on television, like the Born Identity type of movies, when in fact none of that exists. And so now we have a show that we're sort of able to slowly work through the technical advances that we have today. And ideally, like I, say th I said this in a, an interview, I want every member of Congress to have watched Mr. Robot, to have said, oh wow, this is possible, because we need to have everyone that is in a decision-making ability in, in government to know that everything that we have is vulnerable from a, a cybersecurity perspective. Okay, so you'd mentioned uh, you, you have to run things by NBC Universal's legal team. Uh, I just want to know how it went uh, when you decided it was okay for Elliot to go pirate a movie with uTorrent and have all the scene <laughs> release groups tagged on it. Can you elaborate on that at all? <laughs> there are a lot of fun Easter eggs that are hidden in the show, and that's one of them. And luckily, that wasn't a discussion. So, but now it will be. Now, now it, will it will be. be. Thank you for bringing attention to it. <laughs> you seriously, you never cleared that. <laughs> I mean, we cleared uTorrent. I, I looked into some other tools instead. I didn't actually, um, you know, uTorrent was the only the only tool that cleared. And I will always go with a tool that clears, as opposed to ripping off another one or, or you know reimagining a design. So for, I can speak to that. Um, for the, the the pirate groups, I <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I noticed on that screen, too, that Elliot is a pretty bad leecher. He, like, lets up very, he shares very little, but he takes <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where he got that tactic from, either. <laughs> Just, it's weird. So um, I heard you say that the screens are recreated with Flash, and that's kind of interesting because most of them are just text-based screens, and you could either just, like, for example, there's a Python script in the last episode I watched. Why don't you just write it in Python um, to create a mock-up of what it's doing? Or even rather than that, just have a server that is literally being, you know, a, a t um, your own, you know, test server that you're literally hacking. Um, so we're actually seeing what's happening rather than doing it in Flash. What's the idea behind using Flash? So we've explored a lot of these options, and unfortunately, since we're the first, I believe we're the first show to even bring this much effort toward this, kind, this level of authenticity, it's only me on set. It's only me and uh, a video animator, video engineer. So the way to utilize uh, the crew's time, um, you know, the actor's time, the best way to do it in the, in the most uh, time efficient way of doing it at this point is creating a flash animation only because we have medium shots and wide shots where we have actors wa sitting at the computer, you know, sitting in front of a workstation, and they need to walk through the animation and get the right, you know, get to the right detail on the screen. And the added effort of actually trying to teach them the correct commands and relying on that, or standing off to the side with a wireless keyboard and running it myself while they're kind of faking it, it's, it, it, it doesn't make as much sense as Putting, putting them in front of an interactive animation where they can just freely type and the right content will show up on the screen and we can easily reset it and go for take two immediately after. Um, my hope is in future seasons, as I grow this team, that we can delve into that more and show, it, show that in a more realistic light. Uh, because Mainly because recreating these things in Flash, there's so much room for error 
and typos and just, just weird behavior that I spend so many hours uh, with Adam Brustein, our amazing animator. Uh, we go back and forth just, just really finessing these animations. I would love to do it for real, but that takes, you know, I have to convince uh, our producers and I have to convince the studio that it's, it's, worth, it's worth it to them to bring on a bigger team to, to really manage that. Because when you're on set and the crew is like trying to make their day and they're behind, uh, no one's thinking about the tech. No one. The only person on set thinking about the tech is me, uh, which, which sucks. The, the, the short answer is, as a society, we will never get rid of Flash. <laughs> <laughs> it will survive the apocalypse like Twinkies and cockroaches. Like cockroaches. Flash will never go away. The, the other thing to think about is, in terms of the accuracy of what you see on screen, you couldn't do that with a Python script. Because if you had a script that just spewed out the things that are supposed to come up on a hack, that's not really the hack. That's a very artificial simulation of what's supposed to come up. What they're doing is they're creating uh, an animation based on the intelligence they get from technical experts. In, in cases where I, I've put stuff together, we've done the hack, demoed it, filmed it, sent it to them. They've looked at that, and then they made their animation. So that animation is an accurate recreation of the hack with the right timings, the right output, so it's really as accurate as you can get without doing it. I would say there are only two options are, do it or do what they're doing now. And what they're doing now is pretty good, although it seems it's pretty effort heavy for <laughs> Core and the others. I'd love to see them do it for real, but the reality is I've been hacking for, what, 25, 26 years of my life. Uh, I'm probably way better than any actor and I find it hard to do that. Many of the hacks that I filmed and made and sent over, I had to do four or five times to get it right, to work out bugs, to do it. That's a hell of an effort for a production crew to have to take on. And even after the fact, when I'm like, after they send me that material, I'll go back and forth with them because maybe we're working in a different distro. Or maybe uh, you know we're in a different. I don't, I don't know. I need. I want to nail what the prompt looks like under these circumstances. So I'll I'll ask these follow-up questions of you know if I'm if my goal is to replace IP addresses with Easter eggs or you know host names stuff like that. So it's this constant dialogue I have with this team about the, the hacks that they're creating and how how to successfully recreate them for the show. Thanks. Thank you. I have, one <coughs> I have one question, though, for Core, or I guess the team, and it's uh, around the timeline. And so my last article at Playboy, I noticed that you had a character, they walked by, and they had a rest in peace, you know, American economy with the, the date. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out, well, how many months has it been since the hack? So what version of the software are we at? You know, like what Android versions are we using or whatever? So unless the show is progressing at current day rate, <clears throat> you're going to be in a situation where you've got to use like older and older distros to be time period accurate. So that is a whole other level of nightmare. Fortunately, the government will never be using the most up-to-date anything. So. <laughs> hey, we, the government is off XP. Hey, no more XP. No, but to, to Jeff's point, uh, the season two starts 30 days after the end of season one. And the big evil core pack took place on 5-9-2015. So uh, of all the, the pieces of software that I clear, I need to find the version that was out in May of 2015, which is, which is kind of tough. Uh, and it's going to make our jobs harder and harder as each season progresses because we're treating that timeline in real time and we're just picking up where we leave off at each season. So it's, uh, it's going to get more difficult. Next question. Hi. So I was wondering about the season two trailer arc where that idea came from and whether or not that's going to continue at all in the future. So what he's referring to is um, the phone number yeah. that was in the season two trailer that led to led you somewhere, which led you somewhere else, which set you on um, this whole this whole code breaking uh, this code breaking game. And we have hidden a lot of that in season two. Every single episode of season two, there are elements of uh, code breaking, and anyone who's familiar with the DEF CON badge contest will get a huge kick out of just 
dealing with what we've hidden in season two. So my answer to you is yes, that will continue. I, can't, I don't want to give you too much information on where to find those little hints and where, where they are, but I know just based on monitoring uh, the Reddit uh, our subreddit and Twitter, that not all of them have been found and more are coming. Could you actually give a little intro to how that idea came to make that arg happen? I wanted to do this in season one. And I bugged Sam and I bugged uh, people at the studio of just using real IP. It started off with just, I wanted to use real IP addresses and real phone numbers. Huge argument can't use real phone numbers, finally convinced them to let me use real IP addresses. They gave me a pattern of IP addresses for season two that I'm using. And then once the digital marketing team at USA caught on that our fans were this into it and screenshotting, uh, sc screenshotting every screen, and I gave them examples of people attempting to hit these servers that we show in season one or complaining about you know, our fake IP addresses that we use in season one. Uh, so. The, d the digital marketing team, I think they kind of just, between seasons one and two, were convinced that this was worth their time and effort. So now I'm working very closely with them to build out this kind of interaction. And uh, it's a goal of mine. And in, in, in season two, if you see an IP address or you see a URL, it will, it will lead somewhere. I can, tell, I can tell you that much. When, when I first started working with Cora in the first sequence that I, I helped out with, um, I had done an on-screen mock-up and then I did a copy paste of the terminal text to make it easier for the animators. And I used, uh, because it was all in VMs, I was using uh, RFC 1918 addresses so that my simulation could have hosts talk to each other, but the situation required routable addresses. So I just, in the copy paste, like made up an IP off the top of my head and stuck that in there. And I sent an email to Cora and then I was like, I wonder who owns that IP block. So I go into a who is on it and it's DOD IP space. <laughs> so. <laughs> I emailed him immediately after. I was like, hey, you guys are probably going to change the addresses, but just in case, um, don't use that address because I pulled it out of my ass, but it turns out I don't want someone seeing the show and then trying to hit that address. So, go ahead. With, the, with that being said, to this gentleman to my left who made a comment about CSI Cyber and the digital marketing. So on Monday, I'm going to redirect CSICyber.com to Mr. Robot. Because <laughs> I control CSI Cyber.com, and they took my idea in 2008, and I'm pissed at them. CBS and Paramount now are going to have to say tough shit, because I'm going to forward that to push the show. And when people go to CSI Cyber.com, it's going to Mr. Robot come Monday. <laughs> Google it. Check it out. Okay, so you've already, uh, you've already touched upon the dealing with the legal team a lot, but I was just wondering, like, what kind of stuff have they rejected that you wanted to do? And, like, what, what the negotiation process is kind of like? Unfortunately, I can't go into detail about what they rejected without naming some of the, the companies that were involved in those talks. But I know that it starts off with me presenting my best case scenario. So here, here's my top three choices of tools to use for this specific hack. And we're already working to do that. And sometimes, if, if something doesn't clear, I'll go back to these guys and be like, you know, what other tools can we use that we can get away with? And um, so our clearance coordinator will talk to our legal department and they'll assess the risk and figure out, is it worth it to approach this company or is it worth it to just kind of stay away and, you know, do our own thing with, and make up a fake name? or I make up a fake design, which is 100% of the time what they want me to do. And so that's a huge point of contention, and I'll go back and forth with our clearance department or our legal department about that. And I understand it. I understand that that's their job, and that's, that's, that's great. Uh, so it, it speaks to, you know, it's hard for me to reach out, and I, and I did have these talks with these guys, and I, luckily Mark knows some of these guys. So I, I asked him, I remember asking him when we, um, I can't tell you what tool it is, but there's a tool that shows up in episode nine of this season where I asked him, like, are these guys fans of the show? Like, are these guys, these guys are hackers, right? They're gonna, they dig the show. They won't be, they'd be cool if, if we reached out to them and, and asked them to, you know, to get it, to sign a clearance. And he was like, yeah, of course. So against, you know, what, what the legal department wanted to do, we, we, we took that route and luckily it made it into the show. I can't say what it is yet, but it's, it's great, it's awesome. So it's, um, hopefully it's something that will get easier and like I said before, if you guys reach out to me, 
it makes my job a lot easier and we can see, I think we can see a lot more in the show if you guys just make first contact. Cool. Hi guys, big fan of the show. Thanks for making it happen. Um, my question is, I really like the scene with the, the Faraday cage in, and I'm wondering if you, you have any plans for other consumer products or anything that helps protect mobile privacy and security. Can you say the last part of that question one more time? Anything in the works to help protect mobile privacy and security from either like a hard good or software good? Do you have a, a couple of that one? Yes. <laughs> I, th I thought you were going to talk about the Faraday cage that White well, Rose It's, was it's in. one of those things that if you go into it, then we sort of expose things, right? I mean, it's not, I, I remember talking to Core about this because one of the, at one point we were in a conversation where he did say, well, we already reused the we used the Faraday cage once, we can't do it again. So as we have more ideas, because I have a couple in my head, I, I don't really want to tell you <laughs> because I want you to sort of see it in, in season three. Uh, it's probably fair to say there's stuff that's going to come up. The thing that drives it, though, is the story. We are kind of slaves to the story. We're trying to find technology that fits into the story. And the main thing I want to see with the tech that I, I put into it is so if you put the wrong tech in, it can be really jarring. You know, you're watching this great story, you're getting immersed into it, and then someone does something fundamentally stupid. And you look at it and you're like, oh. And suddenly you're out of the story and it's really not that interesting anymore. So what we do has to fit in nicely. Any opportunity for something that's come up, we will we'll look at it and we'll, we'll try and use it because we want it to be realistic. And at the same time, we want to use it to send a message. And the best way to do that is to use cool things. Yeah, and I think you're doing a great job. I guess it was kind of a leading question because taking a repeated idea of a standalone Faraday cage and making it more mobile is what I'm holding in my hand right here. So <laughs> I want you guys to use it. It's called Silent Pocket. Product placement. <laughs> <laughs> Big shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Mine's a grid. I like it. Uh, how you doing? Uh, For those who can't see, he's wearing an evil corp shirt. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, putting together a show about hackers that doesn't suck. Um, should I speak for everybody? <laughs> That's about the best compliment you'll get from us, right? <laughs> though, though, Sneakers is a great movie, so Sneakers starting out yeah. there. Sneakers is awesome. And War Games. War Games. War Games. War Games. War Games. But, those are, but those are movies, not a TV show. That is true. Um, question about the Easter eggs. They're starting to get more complicated. Um, like, what's, what's the thought process around coming up with the Easter eggs? Is it you guys? Because they sort of seem to be inspired by, like, Cicada 3301 kind of puzzles and shit. So is that you guys, or is it, like, the media team? or like who's So the it's the media team and myself uh, working on it primarily. Sometimes I'll check in with these guys about uh, and, and just, just ask for advice about where it would lead. Um, so you I know guys ship the hoodie that we got for solving the... The, the American Giant hoodie. The F Society yep. hoodie. That thing is badass. Thank That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, it, yeah it's, I, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to ruin it and I don't want to spoil the fun out there for everyone who's involved in it. But it is a back and in addition to posting the show and, and you know, get, getting through these cuts and trying to, trying, to, trying to finalize everything, I'm still working with the digital marketing team nonstop on just the Easter eggs alone, which is a huge... Uh, which is a taxing effort, but it's um, it's it's amazing how many people are into it. And I'm so glad, and it's really satisfying. Just the online response that we're getting from it is is awesome. It's it's, it's more than I could have asked for, which is great. So I'm really excited about it. Sick. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question. You, we're talking a lot about American viewers, but wh what's your experience with international viewership? Um, I have a. From what I can gather, uh, I know that it's not the show is not available streaming all over, it, like completely inter internationally. So people have to cut some corners to to watch it, depending on where they live. And last I checked, we were the number one pirated show <laughs> within the past month or so. Um, which I'm fine with. I know people at the network probably hate me saying this, but I'm fine with that. Uh, so. 
and, and, and just the social media response we've been getting uh, internationally from, from Latin America, from Europe, it's, it's been phenomenal. And it's, it's, just, it's just so, it's, it's really satisfying to see that the show is striking a chord um, on a global scale like that. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Francis here. <laughs> Go ahead. Salut. So uh, I had a really good question, but I kind of forgot what it was. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you I can step aside and let the next person, if you want to think yeah. about it. I, uh, I I apologize for asking this one, um, but uh, there's been a lot of speculation online about what Atsu is as a command, and um, oh, yeah. what what can you say that again? Atsu in the first season, in the beginning, he uses a command called Atsu. It just kind of looks like sudo or something like that, but. Uh, um, is, is, it, is it an internal thing to evil core? What's, what's, it, what's the official response on that? So the official response, and I, I knew I was going to get this question one day. <laughs> um, <laughs> none of us worked on the pilot. Ah, okay. So the pilot had uh, their own consultant who uh, I don't know how present he was, in, and I don't know how, what kind of interaction he had with the animator on, on the pilot. Uh, what, I, what from what I have heard, he just left him with a stack of code, and left him to sift through it. So you have an animator who's never even worked in a in a Linux distro before, staring at code, and he doesn't know what it means, and he has to figure out how to animate it and and recreate it for uh, a pilot of a TV show. So Atsu is probably just a misstep. It's just right. a, and there actually there are a lot of there are a lot there's a lot of things like that I could point out from the pilot. That, right. that even I have issues with. Um, so luckily, we were able to kind of remedy that once we got the series pickup, and I was working on uh, episodes two through 10 to, to make sure that that didn't happen. Cool, thank you. Thank you. I think one of the other things you have to remember is these, these kinds of shows evolve. They, they're not static. And as they move on, there are additional dimensions that get added. Things get better, processes change. So I think you can say, reliably, this show is just going to go from strength to strength. That, that sort of raises the question, Corey, you and I talked previously when I'd asked you, like, where, where do you envision the show going? I, the show is operating at many, many layers. And uh, you've got the basic plot of the hacking. You've got Elliot's sort of mental deterioration and his whole issues with his father and things like that. You've got the control issues and all of its permutations of hacking and things like that. Now you've introduced this whole thing with White Rose. There are a lot of sort of tangents coming, and we've seen other, sto other shows fail spectacularly when they're trying to juggle too much. Lost, for instance. Yeah. Um, how are you guys ensuring that you guys don't get lost, essentially? Great question. Uh, Sam and the other writers and I have a roadmap for where we want this season to go. Uh, unlike some of the other shows that were mentioned, I, th I have a feeling they were writing themselves into a corner because they didn't really know what the end, what the end beat was, what the conclusion of, th of the story was. We know where we're headed and we have certain milestones that we're trying to reach on the way. So I don't feel like we're ever gonna get, get into that situation as long as we stay true to organically where our characters are emotionally and where the journey would take them. So as long as we're tracking Elliot and, and the other members of F Society emotionally and organically doing, serving the story uh, justice, I, think that's, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, and I know some people have had some issues with the pacing of season two and the first couple episodes being a little slow. I've read a lot of reviews and blogs about that. And, and really all I can say is like, we dropped a huge bomb at the end of season one. Uh, we destroyed the economy. Elliot had the, the, the realization that you know, uh, he, ha he has delusions um, and he's suffering uh, fr from, you know, he's, that, he's, he, that he's basically insane. And he needs to re he needs to re he needs to work that out. He needs to reconcile that. And I think the him working out those issues and those inner demons and connecting it metaphorically to you know you know things that are are common to the tech crowd, whether they be infinite loops of insanity or or kernel panics. Um, I think that I think that's organically where the story needs to go. And I still find it. I think it, I think it's compelling and intriguing. So. Hang in there. That's all I'll say. I, I sort of add that I, I think you'll start to get a bit more explanation as to the history of things as you go through. You know, we, there was a lot of allusion to, to certain things just happening. Now let's try to figure out and help you understand why that happened and how the characters grew. And you know, that that does take time. But I will tell you this without revealing any spoilers: it gets 
fantastic in a few episodes, and then you, you'll get to the end, you're gonna be like, wow, right? Like, it's there. <laughs> so just kind of like make it through some of the character development. And you're just gonna like, you're gonna get to that point. And you're gonna say, I did not know that. <laughs> I can't tell you which episode, but it, it's coming soon. Dan. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I love the show, the Raspberry Pi gag, where Elliot got called out for holding one up. Like the timing on that was like, that's a Raspberry Pi. That's a Raspberry. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, with the inclusion of the scene from Hackers, who is involved in that conversation? Like, it just this panel shows that there's a lot of care and effort that goes into making this not give information about hacking, but that specific piece of of, of script just calls it out. Uh, were you part of that? Was there a discussion like, ah, we're really calling the question here? How'd that go? I was a part of that, and that was just our uh, meta moment of kind of poking fun at ourselves, basically. And um, even though it's ridiculous, I love that movie. I grew up watching that movie. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people in here are fans of that film. And um, you know, other writers in the room are fans of it as well. And it was a fun way of kind of calling out that you know some there's going to be a TV show that's going to fuck it up, you know, and, you know, maybe we, we might be, we might be that show and hopefully that, you know, hopefully we're not, but at the time of writing that script, it was a, it was a cool little joke that we wanted to incorporate. And I think the community loved it and embraced it because I, I have a feeling that everyone in this room has probably bashed hackers at one point or another. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a fun scene. I, for one, would love to see F society on rollerblades. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's why I own rollerblades. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I love your show. Um, had to write it down. Uh, Closer <laughs> to the mic. Sorry. Oh, I love your show. And, um, uh, and thank you again for teaching our parents uh, what we do. <laughs> um, so as a woman who codes, um, you mentioned that there was a favorite hack uh, that was failed. Um, so I was just, uh, any thought to maybe giving an unsuspecting female <laughs> that uh, the role that's like kind of on the same same level as Elliot. Well, I think uh, season two we made an effort to really flesh out the rest of our cast, and I know that season one is more of a, Elliot's journey and figuring out what is happening. Season two is more about dealing with the consequences and repercussions of what happened, and it gives us an opportunity for them to deal with it and. I think if you, uh, you've seen enough of season two at this point to know that we're spending a lot more time with our female hacker characters and our female our female cybercrime character, and it's it's a hope of mine that you know we continue to do that and you know just just keep watching for season two. It's, it's something that we are definitely uh, moving forward. So, thank you. I, I will say this though, um, it, it, I look in the room and it's it's refreshing as well to see the diversity because it's not there at, uh, all the time in the C-suite of the conversations that we have about this. And so as the community is growing and learning, to find people that look like me or look like her that are in the room is just, you know, very awesome. Yeah, it's funny, Core, Core, we had actually talked about this, the diversity on the show and how it was very intentional in terms it was of ethnicities it was by, and everything. It was by design. We wanted to make sure we had badass female hackers a part of F Society. We wanted to have an Iranian hacker. We wanted Romero to be, you know, the old school uh, freaker that joined the group. And, and Mobley is of Indian descent. So we're, we're, we're definitely, it, it was definitely by design. And we definitely, want, um, our hope is that it does inspire that kind of diversity that Andre is talking about, definitely. The thing is, left. when you, you look out at the DEF CON audience, you realize that the hacker community is that diverse, yeah. which is why it's really great to see a show that actually represents what we look like. So we've got just five minutes more. We'll take a few more questions. So I, I always have a lot of empathy for the, the thief, the perpetrator, or the... We can't the hear you. Talk to close. I always love... I always have a lot of empathy for the, the victim and the perpetrator, but um, have you ever thought about having a backstory for Philip Price? <laughs> I realize their target story is the 99%. But more important question is, have you thought about the kids' workshops that we have here that uh, only through our children we will conquer? Actually, Mark and I were just talking about uh, the kids' workshops, and uh, I think we're a couple of us are probably going to do a talk 
at one of those, uh, either tomorrow or you know tomorrow afternoon. To answer your your Philip Price question, yes, <laughs> we've thought about the backstory, and uh, if you keep watching, you'll 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 get you'll get some more of that. Go ahead, next question. I just wanted a decent photo. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> my question uh, has to do with uh, personal security. So obviously, uh, season one, Elliot's hacking social media sites, emails for you know his uh, coworkers or whatever. Um, I understand people with simple passwords aren't going to be doing two-factor authentication or anything of that nature. However, most service, not most services, there are services, uh, Gmail, Facebook. If you log in from another system, it's going to send you an email that notifies you. Granted, if he has access to those other emails, it's null and void. Yep but he'd have to be doing a lot at one point in time. He's just one guy. Was there ever a conversation about that uh, in the tech world? And if so, what was the reasoning behind not including uh, login notifications? It's a question of time. It's always a matter of time and how much real estate we have on the page and how much time we have in the cut to devote to a hack. And even the steps that we want to show, we can't always show them all. They always get cut down in the editing process. So it, it is a conversation we've had, and it's just us making the decision of like what are the important beats we need to see to, to convey the story about this hack and how he's compromising this account. Um, but to your point, if I can get that level of detail into the show, that's my goal. I think that's all of our goal is to get as much detail as possible into those se into those sequences. Thank you. I, we have time for both of these questions, so right. Go ahead. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm really big fan of the show. My friends and I just love it. Um, my question is: so you mentioned that like you get feedback from Sam when you get something wrong, like there's a typo or or somebody points out that like a screen is wrong or the command doesn't work right. Um, but have you gotten any feedback about? sort of the show being used to teach. Um, I had an opportunity at my job to introduce some uh, colleagues of mine who are not part of this field to my field, which is forensics. And I said, if you want to know what hacking is, who hackers are, please go watch the show. Um, so, and I had people nodding and, and I, people have come back to me, one or two have come back and said, oh my God, this, I've watched the show, it's amazing. And I'm frightened. But, so my question is, have you heard, <laughs> have you heard about whether it's somebody in the C-suite or a teacher or you know, just a person saying, I was inspired by your show. Have you gotten the feedback about the show being used for good, I guess? 100%. Um, you have a story you yeah, want to I tell mean, about this? Uh, I, I, I was in meetings all week for work, and I don't think a single person, be they uh, you know, engineer, a practitioner, or uh, at the executive level, hasn't gotten that out of the show and enjoys the increased awareness, enjoys the fact that they, it caused them to think about an attack technique or an attack vector that maybe wouldn't have come first to mind otherwise. So. Um, I definitely think that's one of the ways that it can be a force for good and a force for educating. And one of the best compliments I've ever received, and I've received it on numerous occasions, is you know people will come to me and say, "I don't usually watch television. Like I, d I don't watch, I don't binge watch anything. I don't watch TV, but I watch Mr. Robot because of the, the hacks that you guys portray and how how scared it makes me <laughs> about my you know using my devices. So uh, you know it's amazing. It's so, uh, I'd say you you actually have the leader of the free world as your fan <laughs> of Mr. Robot. It was actually very interesting because I was on set and Sam was super excited and he's like, the president loves our show. <laughs> and he's like, and like got contacted by his personal aide and said, actually, I don't even know if I should be saying it, but I think it's important because he said like, I, you binge watch the show and loves Mr. Robot and wanted to see season two. And it's like, that is, the levels that we're getting, right? I mean, that's exactly what we're looking for because then it's just a trickle down, right? I mean, if we can get it there, then we're getting others in government and we're getting others in the C-suite and, and it's that conversation that I'm, I'm hoping that we get, right? And my, my hope is that's the reason he's interested in the show and it's not because we impersonated him in the first episode of season <laughs> two and he just wants to see what's up and what we're doing. So definitely, I think that's great. I also don't know when he binge watched season, <laughs> Mr. Robot. I don't know where he has time, the president. But. Air Force One. Ah, touche, he has a plane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question is, uh, as far as getting this onto a network channel, like was, fr from the network's perspective, was it, you know, here's a hacking show and some, they're saying something about maybe it's technically accurate or was the technically accurate part something that they actually cared about? 
the technically accurate part was something that Sam cared about. I'm not sure that the network was that in, invested in it at that point. They just saw a great script written by an auteur filmmaker like Sam, and they wanted to pursue that, that project. I think once the pilot came out and Sam was able to deliver that level of authenticity, it set the bar and the expectation, and you have network executives reading you know, these articles published by tech journalists talking about the technology on the show. So I think it was something that was always on Sam's radar that he wanted to pull off. And luckily, when I met him, we were completely in line about that. And you know, to his credit, he just kind of empowered me and let me fight, whoever, fight with whoever I had to fight with to get that level of detail into the show. And obviously, the fact that I was able to grow the team for season two speaks to the p point that the network is and the studio are s uh, supportive of that effort, which is great. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I think we're out of time. Uh, so just join me in uh, thanking the panelists, first of all, for a great show and their participation today.